so tonight we have a very special guest. Um, my, my, probably my very first roommate in my entire life um, and my former teammate, uh, Mandy Yep. So without further ado, let's give Mandy a round of applause. Yay, Mandy. <laughs> the crowd goes wild. <laughs> so um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is a really casual, like almost conversation-like evening. Um, it's the reason why we put this whole thing together um, is to basically inspire and kind of bring some positivity into your life. Um, I know for some of you, you are in lockdown and it's been tough. Uh, Manitoba has gone through a few more restrictions too. So um, we're not allowed to have anyone in our houses coming to visit us inside or outside anymore. So that's kind of a bit of a bummer, but thank goodness for Zoom because now we can connect and you can all come and join me in my basement. And hopefully you don't hear my crying baby. Um, uh, my little boy, Mateo is screaming for mommy right now, but I can't join him. So hopefully daddy can help him out with that. <laughs> Anyways, Mandy, welcome. How are you? I'm, I'm great. It's so great to be here. And, and like you said, like it's a Saturday night and what better way to spend it than with old friends. So it's awesome. I love that. Uh, we have some new friends, old friends. I'm probably one of the older ones now. <laughs> um, and yeah, we're just you know, super pumped that you agreed to do this um, on short notice. And uh, yeah, and we're pretty, pretty excited. So I'm gonna start uh, with uh, Mandy's uh, bio. Um, so Mandy grew up at the Martin School of Dancing, uh, which is a multidisciplinary studio in Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, she was a member of the Sundown Optimus Buffalo Gals and the Martinets Dance Troupe during her time at the studio. In 1994 and 95, Mandy was part of the Canadian world team traveling to Ontario where, where they won the silver world medal and Switzerland where they won the bronze. Uh, she loved everything about the studio and apprenticed under her mentor Maureen Johnson as an assistant teacher during her years in high school. Um, in 1996, Mandy taught with Leisha, Kristen and Jane at the Aerial Fusion Baton Company, um, helping start um, large baton clubs in Lorette and Steinbeck. So she grew the uh, uh, recreational um, program, like it grew huge when she was in Winnipeg. Um, I'm not sure how long you were in Winnipeg for, I think two, three years, perhaps? Four. Four, four years in Winnipeg. And we lived together in a, a few <laughs> apartments <laughs> um, and had some fun times and some crazy memories um, and lived off bagels and uh, McDonald's cheeseburgers and oatmeal for quite a while when we were starving students. Um, in 1999, Mandy opened up Star Baton and Dance Company offering baton twirling and dance lessons to children in Airdrie, Alberta. Twirling students from SBDC represented Canada at their first ever International Cup under the direction of Mandy Yip and Lorraine Dermody. In 2006, she was awar awarded ownership of the club to the parents and it was renamed Sky High Twirlers. In 2009, Mandy sold SBDC, both Sky High Twirlers and SB SBDC remain successful programs in Airdrie. In 2012, Mandy launched Acrobatic Arts. As the founder and CEO of Acrobatic Arts Inc., Mandy manages the staff and delivery of all training programs and the acrobatic syllabus in over 6,500 dance studios in over 30 countries. Yes, Mandy. Yes, girl. <laughs> over 500,000, 500,000, yes dancers participate in acrobatic arts classes week on a weekly basis. Mandy created the acrobatic arts training and certification program and the acrobatic arts curriculum, producing the most comprehensive research program available for acro dance. A lifelong learner, Mandy has achieved certification in countless courses, including contortion, hand balancing, inclusive learning, tap, jazz, gymnastics, and safe coaching, to name a few. Mandy currently sits on the advisory board for YPAD. I'm not sure what that means. Mandy, can you, do you know what that means? Yeah, yeah. Youth Protection Advocates for Dance. 
Awesome, and assists the mission of keeping kids safe in dance throughout this organization. Highly sought for workshops, Mandy has taught thousands of dance teachers and provided expert classes around the world. Mandy is known for bringing passion, technique, and in-depth practical knowledge to engaging classes. So welcome, Mandy. Yay. <laughs> wow, that is such an accomplishment, Mandy. I'm so proud of you. Like that, wow, that's really amazing. And, to, and I'm going to start this off by just mentioning that um, with Mandy, uh, she has this huge acrobatic arts um, company and the whole foundation of it is taught by baton twirlers, former baton twirlers. So can you name a few people who are on your staff before we get started with I questions? Want, I don't want to forget anyone, but uh, Sandra Hill, now Elliot, Loren Dermody, uh, Leah Holiday, uh, Jill Ford, Mark Nash, Janae Dorn, Col Colbert, now is her last name. Um, Oh man, I'm gonna feel so bad if Alicia. <laughs> uh, I'll forget if I forget somebody, I'll feel bad. So, but there's just a few. That's amazing, and that's so cool. That like, um, and who helped you kind of develop this program? The beginning, uh, it was Sandra, Loren, Jill, and me that sort of sat down together to put it together. So that was all baton people. And honestly, the way that it was put together really has a lot to do with baton. Baton teaches everything or it builds one thing upon another. And I took that same philosophy and used that to create the acrobatic arts syllabus because nothing had been done like that in dance before. You know, teachers would just see a back walkover and think, I think we'll teach a back walkover today without really understanding how foundations make that skill happen. And it was because I had such great foundations in baton and because everything was taught to me in that way so well um, that I was able to, to use that same, you know, formula for acro. Well, lucky for you, hopefully we get to learn a few things from you now, um, now that you've learned all these things from Baton. Um, okay, so let's get started with our questions. Um, where are you from and what were you like as a kid? So I'm, I'm from Belgoni, Saskatchewan, a little town outside of Regina. Uh, what was I like as a kid? You know, my mom put me into dance class when I was four. I think she really liked the idea of me being, and my mom's on, on today, so... Hi, mom. Um, she Hi, Mrs. Blow. Yeah, of me being in a little pink costume and going on the stage and tap dancing, and and I didn't like it. I quit after I think a year and a half, if I can remember correctly. I just didn't like anything about it, and and so then she put me in everything else. I think she knew that being in some kind of extracurricular activity was good for me. So I was in piano, and I was in Girl Scouts and brownies and a bunch of other stuff, and I, you know, none of it. I didn't really like any of it. So that was me as a as a young kid. And then I'll just keep telling the story because I know your next question. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. It's all good. <laughs> so, um, so then we, we rented this movie from the local video store called Twirl. If you haven't seen it, don't see it. It's awful. <laughs> but in the movie, <laughs> there is a baton twirler. And I saw it and I was like, mom, that's what I want to do. And it was the same year I think that Stacy had returned from the world championships with her first medal from Germany that year. So off we went back to Martin School of Dancing and um, and then and I, I went into baton at that time. That's awesome. I remember that movie. It was not good. No, it's not. It wasn't Joni from Happy Days in that movie? Blair, I think. Oh, Blair. Okay, yes. Someone from, from yeah. one of those shows. All right, so next question. Uh, what are your top three best baton memories? Well, the best part about baton is the people. There's no question about that. I, I learned a lot of great skills twirling my baton and that part was awesome, but it's by far the people that are the best part. So to narrow it down to three is just so difficult to do. It'd have to be um, uh, being with you guys at the world championships. I remember when we, when we first got picked to go, because I I guess I could back up a little bit and tell you how I got back into it. So my mom put me back and put me into baton. I was there for three years and I loved everything about it. And at, after three years, I was 11 years old. My mom and dad sat to me down and they said, you guys, we went into debt. We can't afford this. So we're going to have to pull you guys out of baton because, um, you know, it's just too expensive. We just can't afford to do it. And so my mom 
could see that we were heartbroken and she actually hired people to come to Belgoni and teach us in our in our hometown so that we could keep twirling but we couldn't go to any competitions or anything and when Lucinda was on I, I recalled a little bit of the story about how Lucinda was one of those teachers that she brought in I mean my mom brought in like the world's best teachers to teach us um, and I remember whining to Lucinda and saying you know it's no fair everybody else gets to go twirl with Maureen and gets to go to the competitions and I don't and Lucinda said so get a job like you're 13 years old go get a job if you really want to do it and go back to twirling then you know quit crying about it <laughs> and so that's what I did I so I was out from 11 to 14 at 14 I had enough money saved up from my job to go back to twirling and then I twirled when I was 14 15 and a little bit into 16 so that's how that all came together so when I came back for those two years and I was paying for a lot of it myself, mom and dad were still helping, but a lot of it I had to cover on my own. Um, I mean, I was just so in it. Like <laughs> I was there morning, noon and night. If there was an open gym, I was at open gym. You know, when Maureen said, you know, turn this way or fall on the floor in a swan dive and I, it doesn't matter if I knew how to do it or not, I was on the floor, you know, doing whatever I was told to do. And after two years, well, actually even in the first year, I was, Maureen put me on the team and we got to go to the world championships. I mean, it was like, it was so beyond any dream I could have imagined. And so that whole process, I remember it like it was yesterday. It still gives me shivers to think about um, what that year was like for me and how it shaped me as a person. So for my favorite memories, winning that um, gold medal in Canada and getting the right to go to Ontario <laughs> to compete <laughs> in the world championships. Um, I remember that moment like it was yesterday. It was so exciting. I remember being in the practice gym just before we went on to compete that routine and just being like, I can't believe I'm here. Like uh, nothing was lost on me. I, I didn't take any of it for granted. It was all so exciting. Um, so I remember that moment too. And I remember all the fun times that we had together. I guess I'd have to tell the story about how we went down a hill, a, a mountain actually in Switzerland and uh, hit the guardrail and then ended up in some Swiss village. Kristen, I don't know yeah. if you remember this. Yeah, Inert Kirchen. Oh, geez, you know the name of the place. I don't remember that. I remember the cheese. The cheese was good. So I, remember those, I think those would be my favorite three memories. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, watching your face light up like... I, I feel it because you just like it it seems like it really is your like was your passion you know it was just so yeah amazing I'm I'm really happy that I was able to experience it with you um and yeah I, I have goosebumps just thinking about like just seeing that gym in Toronto or was it Pickering <laughs> where New we market. New Market yes with the patchy floor yeah, yeah. I totally remember that um, okay, so next question. Uh, tell us about your journey after you finished competing in baton and how it led to acrobatic arts. Okay, so I finished my second year that I could afford to pay for and then my bank account was drained. <laughs> and I, I did not want to stop. I really didn't. But I had saved up for a year prior and then I was twirling. So I was going to school during the day, then I was going to twirling, then I was working the night shift at the local diner to try and get enough money to pay for the next lesson. It was like that with me. Um, and by the end of the second year, I had no money left. And um, I remember having like crying and I, I wanted to keep going I just didn't want to quit and, and the writing was on the wall there was just no way I could keep this up I had finished high school it was time to have a life and you know so that was sort of devastating to me but I knew I was going to stay in it I had written in my um, journal my little Maureen had us put down our goals when I was nine years old and I started baton twirling and, and I wrote down my goals which were to catch a one turn, to go to the world championships, and to coach someone who went to the world championships. Those were my goals. I had my short term goal, my medium range goal, and my long <laughs> goal that Maureen wanted me to have. And I had that book with me like all the way through. So even as, as a 17 year old, you know, now I had hit two of them. I caught my one turn and I'd gone to the world championships. So then it was time to like hit the third thing. And I asked Maureen if I could come and teach Buffalo Gals. And she's like, no. <laughs> 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 uh, and she you know, she was actually right, but it, uh, it still broke my heart at the time. So what I did instead was I 
called up my good friend Kristen and I said, you know, how about Aerial Fusion? Is there a spot for me there? And Leisha too, of course. And you guys welcomed me with open arms. And so I headed to Winnipeg. And uh, we had a really good time in Winnipeg, start, you know, working on Aerial Fusion. And I did start satellite groups in Lorette and Steinbach where we grew that those two sections, which I was sort of in charge of, grew to being about 70 kids uh, in the time that I had them. Uh, I loved everything about that. I was driving in, I think it's an hour to get to Steinbeck, isn't it? So I'm yeah, driving it's, an it's a long drive. Like in winter in Winnipeg, but didn't care. I was like, I'm going to teach baton. And it, the whole time I'm thinking like, I've got to get to the plates. I've got to get these beginner two-hand twirlers to the world championships because that's my goal, you know, that, that may have been a little far reaching um, <laughs> given the commitment of the kids that I was working with at the time. But, um, but that's, that's sort of where I went to in Winnipeg. And then I met the love of my life, Jason, through a company called College Pro Painters. And I have to mention College Pro because it leads to what happens next, which is um, I kind of learned how to run a business while I was there. So College Pro Painters, if you don't know what it is, it's a bunch of students, they get a loan from the government, they go out and they paint houses for the summer. At the end of the summer, they own ten. They owe ten thousand dollars back to the BDC. <laughs> That's pretty much how it goes. And so I owe ten thousand dollars at the end of the summer. But I had a really awesome education. I learned so much about running a business that summer that the ten grand was totally worth it. So I took all of that knowledge and picked up and moved to Calgary with Jason, where we got married. And that's when I started um, Star Baton and Dance Company. Cool. That's awesome. And then where'd you go from there? How'd you get to acrobatics arts from there? <laughs> Sorry. Tell us your whole life story. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, so I'm running this little baton club and it went from seven kids in the first year to 45 kids in the second year. Um, and at our highest, we were at about 580 students. Wow. Um, we got, had a huge base of kids. The highest that we ever had for twirlers was 186 twirlers and over 50 kids on the competitive team. So it was a pretty big operation. We also offered tap jazz and ballet and hip hop and all the other stuff. And baton was still my biggest love at the time. Um, I loved, I still love everything about baton, but I, it was just everything that was in me. I, I was still just as excited as I was in Newmarket, like about to take the floor for the first time. And um, I, I actually was able to take two of our students uh, with Lorenz help to the International Cup in St. Paul, the first year that they offered that competition. And uh, I felt like I had ticked off the third box at that time. Uh, at that time, I also had two little boys at home. Neither of them wanted to do, have anything to do with dancing or twirling at all. They just were plain old flat, no mom. And I, I'm like, what? This is what we're going to do. We're going to like we're gonna stay at the studio together every night. It's gonna be so much fun. They're like, no, it's not happening. And so I recognized that I had to make a choice because if I was gonna put the kind of effort and work into the studio that I knew it needed in order to have this kind of success I was um, used to, I needed to be there every night and every weekend and Saturdays and Sundays and Christmas and you know, all the days, right? Um, and I knew that wasn't gonna work when my kids went to school because I wanted to be at home with them in the evening. So I sold the studio with the intention of being a stay-at-home mom. I was going to just stay at home, raise my two boys. My husband had a great job. I didn't need to work. It was going to be great. And within six months, I had started writing the syllabus because I just can't sit. Like, it just doesn't work for me. So That doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> so a couple of my friends who also own studios in Calgary had contacted me and said, would you come and teach our acro classes? We need good acro teachers and we don't there's nobody that teaches that around here and I, I thought to myself you know if I start teaching every night I'm going to end up in the same position I'm going to be working nights and weekends and that doesn't work for my family so what I did instead is I said I'll put together all my teaching materials I'll put it all together with a syllabus and a curriculum and I'll come teach you how to do it and then you teach it and it'll all be good and as you probably guessed from the story so far, um, I'm a little bit of an overachiever. So that turned into video and photo and a manual and, you know, the whole nine yards. And when I brought it to my friends, they said, you know, you really need to sell this. More people need to know about what, what you've created here. This is really good. And so I opened up a few courses. My first one was at Martin School of Dancing, right where it all started. That's where I taught my very first certification course. We had 18 people register and take that course. And uh, within the year, we had over 100 certified teachers. And two years later, we had over 3,000 certified teachers. So we just went like 
like really, really fast. And now you have how many? Now there are over 6,500 certified teachers. That's awesome. That's so, so awesome. Um, this isn't in our questions, but I just um, remember you telling us about when you were um, going to get your syllabus trademarked or, um, and you had to apply for it. Do you remember the story, Mandy? You said you had, you had your little binder and there was- Oh no, oh. that's my US visa. Oh, okay. <laughs> to be able to teach in the US, I see. Yeah, I needed to get a US visa to be able to cross back and forth over the border all the time. And I, I get to the, I get the meeting. I don't know what I'm doing. I never know what I'm doing for just for everyone's <laughs> reference. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm doing. I look on the online. It says, you know, put together these documents and click here to set up a meeting with the people. And so I do. And when I got there, I'm sitting down and I've got my little binder with my materials that I'm supposed to have. And beside me, there are two lawyers and a businessman and two lawyers and a businessman with boxes of materials. And I'm like, hmm, okay, I think maybe I misread the website. Maybe, you know, I don't know exactly what I'm doing. Um, but I got my interview, I went in and talked to them and they gave me my visa. And, and the other two businessmen did not get theirs that day. Really? So, yeah. Mm, that's awesome. So, I just put in the chat, sometimes you have to just jump in and swim because that's my motto and I say it all the time to my team. And it's so true. I, I do that all the time. I'll say, you know, by Tuesday, we're going to blah, blah, blah. And I'll have no idea how to do that. But I say we're going to do that on Tuesday and then somehow we figure out how to get there. <laughs> Sometimes I'll even say it's done. Yeah, I already did that. And then I really have to figure out how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely know how to rein in the people. Like, oh my gosh, that's so, so I, inspiring to me. I forgot Loran Meek. So I wanted to say Loran because she's also on my Arbiton. Okay, awesome. Yep. Shout out to Loran. All right. So we have a number of young people and older people um, who are considering starting up a baton club. Uh, what advice would you give them? Okay, so, um, I mean, that's a huge question. It I is. Think there's a lot of things that are important in that question. And I love this question, but it takes me four hours to talk about it. I'll do the very, very short version. There's two parts that you have to love. You have to be passionate about the baton twirling and you have to really care about it and you have to understand the baton twirling and you have to know how it works and why progressions work and all that stuff. And you also have to love the business. You have to understand how taxes work and how important it is to pay your rent on time and how you have to deal with marketing and how Facebook ads work. And if you don't you know, manage both of those pieces equally, then you probably will not be successful. And I think a lot of people in the arts really love this part and they don't really pay enough attention to the art of the business that is so super important. So my biggest piece of advice, if, if you don't already have some kind of business background, is to find a mentor who does have that kind of business background and, and learn the things that you need to know in order to run a solid business, especially if this is going to be your full-time gig. For me, it always was. There was no other backup job or option. I, this was my full-time gig. This is what I wanted to do for a living was teach baton twirling, teach dancing, and then teach acro. Um, so in order to make that happen, all of the other business sides of it have to work. Um, I think the best uh, really simple things that I did to make my numbers grow so quickly were to partner with the schools in the areas that I was in and teach their phys ed classes. So I know right now we're, we're on lockdown, but by September, I think we're gonna be swimming. I got my shot. I know you did too, Kristen. You betcha. I know Susan, no shot for Ontario people. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, you do have yours? Yay, Ron has his, Stephen has his. Oh, good, that's awesome. So <laughs> I'm I'm praying for a September, um, you know, back to normal. I was, normal as it can be. So what I did was I went and I talked to every principal in every school. I did this in Lorette and Steinbeck too. And I said, you know, can I come in and teach your phys ed classes for a whole week for free? And they were like, <laughs> what's wrong with you? <laughs> um, but, and then I also said, I only have these four days available and I, my, my schedule's filling up very, very quickly. But if you get in right now, I can mark you down and I can be here. But if you don't, you know, you probably won't get in. I had oodles of time. I didn't have anything else going on, but by kind of setting that, like, um, you know, might be difficult to get me, it kind of pushed them forward. 
And then I went in and I literally taught in Airdrie when I started in 1999, I literally taught every kid from kindergarten to grade four about baton twirling. Every kid in the city held a baton at some part in their phys ed journey and learned how to do figure eights. And I had this whole shtick about how baton started, probably not all true, but it really worked well, where we had the ninjas, because then it got the boys all excited and we had the majorettes for the girls and and um, taught this whole thing and the kids got to learn a, a few little exchanges and a little toss and catch and I had enough batons for the whole class and at the end they got to get my my autograph because I was a world something <laughs> they didn't know didn't really matter um, so they got my autograph and on the other side of the autograph was a flyer that said we're doing a six-week program if you do the whole six weeks you can get your yellow badge you don't need anything you can come the way you are, we'll supply the baton, we'll supply the, all the stuff. And it had a one-time fee, and I can't remember what it was. I'm gonna say 45 bucks or something like that for the six weeks. And so we got tons of kids registered, more than I expected because I saw thousands of kids that summer. Uh, and I kept that same idea going when we you know, were growing the studio. So that was a really good marketing strategy that was free it was easy you could total anyone could do it if you you know put the time in to do it and so that would be a, a, I think a piece of advice that you could use that is so awesome I actually remember that I forgot about the, <laughs> the autograph I think Stephen put a comment in the chat here about that uh <laughs> has to go for some good money now on eBay. <laughs> oh my gosh yeah like you, you, you dedicated like a lot of time and effort into that. And I think that that's something that, you know, everyone should learn from. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, would your advice differ for someone who wants to teach on the side, kind of part-time, as opposed to someone who wants to teach full-time? Yeah, it probably would. But honestly, I have zero experience with the part-time thing. You know, I, I'm, I'm the kind of girl who jumps in and then tries to figure out how to swim. And so I'm all in all the time. Um, so what that part-time gig looks like to me, I don't, I honestly don't know. So I'm probably not the girl to answer okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. For sure. Um, I'm just like, so like, I mean, how many years have I known you for? And I'm still like, amazed and humbled by like the amount of work and effort you put into your, your programs like 500,000 people doing acrobatic arts that's 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 a not a shabby number <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's amazing oh and um for those of you who are in the crowd um if you watched world of dance um a few of mandy's sort of ambassadors would you call them that um would be um Derek Piquet, uh, Briar Nole, uh, Damien, I can't remember his last name, from Australia, no? Nope. Nope, oh, I just saw a video on your, on your feed. <laughs> but students, we, there's lots of dancers that participate in the programming and then we repost their videos. There's oh, students right. that we work with, but I, okay. I wouldn't know all of their names, so. But Derek is like, like, does commercials for you, right? And, yeah. and Briar, I just saw Briar doing your um, cardio time video that yeah. looked nothing like my kid's video. <laughs> um, uh, okay. If you, it, it, I just watch it for the entertainment value. The first one, maybe, but the, the last, the advanced, the elite version, I, yeah. I don't know if you can do that besides her. <laughs> Yeah, if you haven't had a chance, um, look it up. Um, it's Cardio Time for Acrobatic Arts uh, on YouTube. Is that where we found? I looked it up, I believe. And there's, if you get a chance, look up Briar No Lays because um, there's the toddler version and then there's the Briar No Lay version, which are pretty amazing. <laughs> um, Thanks for talking about Michael Domeski. Is that who you're talking that's about? That's it. Yeah, Michael Domeski. That's right. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and weren't you in the crowd? Didn't you and Loren go fly out to watch? Um, Me and Leah, that was- Oh, you and Leah. My birthday present to Leah that year was uh, to go to watch uh, World of Dance in the crowd and cheer, cheer them on. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm like so fangirling right now. <laughs> so, um, okay, so uh, next question. Were, were you ever scared or nervous about uh, starting up a club or a program? If so, tell us about it. Um, no, I don't think so. I, I don't really get scared of very many things. I, I'm okay with failure, like super okay with it. And there are lots of things that I do that do not work. 
you know, you, we're only talking about the good stuff here, but there are hundreds of ideas that fell flat on their face that nobody talks about because nobody knows about them. Um, and I, I don't know, it just, it doesn't worry me or frighten me at all to fall on my face because I think because I know I can get back up. You know, one of the greatest gifts that my mom and dad gave me was not being able to afford it <laughs> in those years because when I when they couldn't afford to put me back in and I learned that I could do it myself, man, like that just opened every door in the world to me because, the, you know, there was nothing I couldn't do after that. I, I could do anything because... I did that, and that seemed insurmountable to a 13-year-old, right? Mm. How, how would I possibly make that happen? But I did make it happen, and so then once I did that, it's like all of the rest of it just seemed easy, and it still does. You know, I'm, I'm doing things right now that, you know, if I was maybe a little bit more conscious, or maybe, I don't, I don't know if I thought about it too much, maybe it would scare me, but it, it doesn't. That's, you're fearless. <laughs> I feel like, too, you know... Um your successes that you have in your life are, are built upon your greatest failures. So yeah. 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 I feel like you almost like lights the fire under your butt to, to work that much harder. Oh, I lost your picture there, Mandy. Are you still there, Mandy? I am still here, but oh. just... there we go. <laughs> I see you again. That's okay. It was a very pretty picture. Um, okay. So have you ever had any naysayers or come in contact with someone who had negative things to say about your program and how did you handle that? Oh my goodness, all the time. I mean, I, from the beginning, I have had naysayers about all of it. You know, you're going to go back after not twirling for three years. You quit when you were 11 and you had a three turn. And now you're going to go back and you're going to be on the team. Like, mm, I don't think so, honey. You know, that right there was a problem. And I had to, I had to prove myself. And um, opening the studio, I had to prove myself. You know, it, you know, being a dance teacher, being a baton coach for a living, you know, you might want to have a backup plan, sweetheart. You know, that was sort of, everybody said that to me. You, you know, that doesn't seem like a very smart way to go about your life. You should really go to university and make sure you have some other, um, you know, form of making money so that you can do this little side project and not worry about it. And it was the same when I started the studio and it was the same when I started acrobatic arts. You know, that that's cute, but you're not going to make a living teaching cartwheels, you know, so you might want to figure something else out as well. So yeah, that, I mean, that's been, that's been throughout, but I think that just like makes me want to do it. It makes me want to prove everybody wrong, you know, that you can so make a living out of cartwheels and a damn good one, you know, <laughs> watch me. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Plus like, look at all your staff. They're all baton twirlers too. So you <laughs> Yes, you can make a living. <laughs> um, yeah, and Stephen just wrote, and look at you now. So, yeah. Um, well, you're not at all competitive. I mean. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. So competitive. That yeah. is definitely yeah. true. Yeah. The funny thing is, like, I never knew you before you joined the team, so I never knew. I just thought you were just a hard worker like everyone else, like, you know. And I remember you doing swan dive after swan dive. If you don't know what that is, it's basically diving into the floor with your side and your hip crashing into the floor and putting your leg up nice and straight um, with your foot in retire. And Mandy had, like, the biggest bruise. Is it on your hip, I think? Yeah. For... The thing about that trick is that there is a technique to it. Unfortunately, yes. I missed all those days of classes. So <laughs> we, Marine put it into the routine, and I was late every time because I'm, I'm going from the standing position. I remember there was a little suit new turn and then swan dive. That was what we did in that part of the routine. Leisha probably knows because she knows the whole routine. <laughs> and I remember I'm up, and now I'm supposed to be down right now and I don't know how to do that so I just like went down to the floor and put my leg up you know and Mandy you're late everybody go back and do it again I'm feeling horrible because I'm making you guys all do it 20 times because I'm late every time and I just didn't know how to do it so when I came back my whole the whole side of me was covered in bruises because I, I was going from straight up to straight down <laughs> that's a uh, yeah good memories not so much um <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, with the worldwide success of acrobatic arts, what do you think it is about your program that makes it so popular and so enjoyable? Well, going back to what we talked about at the very beginning, there's a few things that come right out of baton that make it work. It's it's the progressions that I that I learned through baton twirling that I was able to 
put into acro so that you know the kid goes from you know just sitting to sitting and doing a little bit to sitting and doing a little bit more and everything builds upon itself just like when you're learning to twirl you know you learn to do the two hand twirl then you learn to do the thumb roll and it drops to the floor then you learn how to do the thumb roll and you pop it off then you learn how to do the thumb roll and you catch it then you learn how to, you know it, everything builds on itself like Legos. And I think when I put acrobatic arts together with the help of some amazing twirlers who also understood that same philosophy, um, it just worked. And when teachers started using it, it worked for them too. And when something works, then it works. And you tell your friends and, and more and more people got on board with it. So I, I really do have to credit twirling to that. And also my team. I have the most amazing people uh, working with me to make this all happen. And some really brilliant teachers, when, when you get into a class and you're learning from our course conductors, the way that they can deliver that information in two days, the amount of information they can deliver and how well they deliver it is really astounding. And, and that's baton people also for a, lot, a, a large part of it, I'd say more than half. Wow. That's so cool. I'm inspired. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see here. What in your mind is considered really great programming? Uh, okay, I think you need to have really awesome customer service. You, you need to communicate with your customer and make sure that they understand what the, what the expectations that they can have of you are and what you are expecting of them as well. And that that is super clear and that it's not ever you know, up for debate. So I think that that really sets the stage for a program that's going to be successful. Um, I think you have to have quality information to pass on. So you have to have a program that's actually going to be, you have to have material that's actually going to work. Uh, that is really important. And you have to have goals and um, something that we're working towards. You have to have something that, that's going to happen that we're going to get to, whether that's a, a performance, whether that's catching a certain trick or doing a certain skill, whether that's, you know, going to a competition. It, it almost doesn't matter as long as there's something that we're working towards and that we're all on the same page going towards that goal. That's awesome. I actually had a conversation with Leisha, uh, was it maybe last week or the week before, and we were talking about how students just want to feel validated and feel like, like, you know, um, acknowledged for what they've done. And um, we remember you sitting in a circle or standing in a circle with all your students and Lorette and you'd say at the end of class, okay, everyone show me your favorite move that you, you, you've learned so far. And, you know, and then everyone claps and like, that's like everything because you, you're put on this pedestal and everyone is supporting you and validating you. And I feel like you've taken that little, little circle from Lorette and kind of expanded it into your acrobatic arts world. Am, am I wrong? <laughs> no, that's, that, is, that is really important. I think everyone wants to feel seen. And, uh, and feel like they have something of value to, to give to the community that they're in, whatever that looks like. And it doesn't look the same for each person. And I think it's really important that um, everybody doesn't feel like they have to contribute the same thing. In fact, it's better if we don't. It's better if we all contribute what we're really good at so that we end up with a more diverse, beautiful picture at the end of it. So for that's sure. important. Awesome. Um, so um, we might have kind of touched a bit on this, but I'll throw it out there anyway. What are your components to a successful program? So, okay, so it kind of depends where you are on the spectrum of it. Where I am right now, um, it's really important to have excellent leadership. So it's important that you know where you're headed and that you can convey that clearly to the people who you're working with, whether that's your students or your staff. Um, it's important that you have all your ducks in a row. So the business part that I talked about earlier, you know, understanding the taxes and the, you know, marketing and all of those things, that's really important. It's important to have cl clear communication so that everyone understands what the expectations of each party is. Um, so I think all of those things together build a program that's going to be more successful. And, and having something that we're all working towards also does, you know. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, what do you tell your new teachers who have completed their acrobatic arts teacher training? Um, and do you t do you t would you provide that same um, advice to baton coaches? Yeah, definitely. And that is, it's okay to take it one step at a time. Don't feel like you have to know everything to get started. 
get started and you'll figure things out as you go along. That's that's how it's always worked for me. And I think sometimes we hold back too much. We wait till everything's perfect before we put anything out there. Because especially people who are in the arts, we want everything to be really good. Because that's kind of how we train, right? We train so that we can do it really, really well. And then we show the finished product off at the end. And my suggestion is to instead jump in and then try to figure it out as you go. Having said that, you can't slack off at that moment. Once you jump in, you better darn well learn how to swim because otherwise you're gonna be in big trouble. Um, and the other piece of that is seek out mentors. Mentors have been really important to me throughout my whole life. Uh, find people who are willing to share their knowledge and their experiences with you so that you don't have to go through everything and make the same mistakes again. And you would be amazed at how many people are out there willing to share what they already know. Um, I don't think there's been a single person who I've, who I've contacted and said, would you be willing to meet with me and tell me what you've already learned, you know, in a mentorship kind of meeting way that has said no, not a single person. And I'm talking, I, I emailed people from Cirque du Soleil that I'd never met, you know, would you be willing to sit with me? Yeah, I'd be willing to sit with you. And I think we're scared to do that. And we shouldn't be because... I, like, if I asked you right now, Kristen, would you be willing to sit with any of these coaches and tell them what you've already learned? The answer is yes, right? Yeah, 100%. The answer is yes for me too, and I do it all the time. And, and I think it's too bad that we don't use that more often, that we don't ask for help more often. Well, thank you for helping us tonight. I think anyone who is sitting here tonight is taking away a huge amount of um, knowledge and probably ideas and, yeah, just... Um, and also your infectious pas passion for uh, baton as well. Um, okay, so uh, how do you maintain a successful club? So successful club like acrobatic arts or like when I own the dance studio? Um, I lump it all together, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, okay, so well, because it is a little different now with, with how many people, because now I have about 50 people that work under me. So there's sort of levels of how people are working and there's people who are in charge of other people and like that kind of thing. So that's a little different than when I owned the studio. Um, I think, you know, you have to, you have to do what you say you're going to do. So if you promise something, you better deliver. Um, don't promise something if you can't deliver. Having said that, you know, stretch yourself. Sometimes I promise things and then I work to deliver and that's okay too, as long as you can deliver. Um, but but don't ever tell somebody you're going to do something and then not do it. I think that that's been key to why we've been successful. Um, people trust what I'm going to say when I say that I'm going to say so, when I say that we're going to do something or when acrobatic art says that, you know, you will never have to pay for this again or this is for life or, you know, this program will show you everything you need to do to start your own acro program. I really mean it. We really will give you all the tools that, that you need to make this happen. So I think that that's, that's probably key. And that's probably why we've been successful. And that's probably why SPDC was successful too. The parents knew that if I said we were going to do something, we were going to do it. Awesome. You tell them like it is, Mandy. <laughs> um, okay, so always like what we were going to do, but we were definitely going to do it. If I said it's going to happen, it's happening. So buckle up. <laughs> See, you're so cheery, even when you're delivering like, you know, <laughs> demands. <laughs> she has like this big smile on her face. My, my team would probably say, they're going to say it in the chat probably, but that I'm a great manipulator and that, <clears throat> that might, that may be, that may be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how have you had to adapt during COVID? I mean, our whole program pretty much shut down. So yeah, that has been a huge adaptation. The way that acrobatic arts is normally taught is we go to cities around the world. We have 30, 30 teachers come into a dance studio with another 30 students, and we learn how to teach acro together um, with the dancers that are there. So obviously, all of that was shut down in a matter of minutes. And so we had um, hundreds of thousands of refunds to process or you better figure something out, Mandy. So we got together on a meeting and came up with the idea of uh, teaching module one online, our, our flagship product, our most important foundations course, um, and how we would be able to manage to do that, how we would figure out Zoom. No, none of us knew how to do Zoom at the time. How, you know, how are we going to um, get dancers 
to work with us so we can show the work on Zoom, well, that means Jill needs to put up a studio in her basement. So let's get some drywall going, you know, like all of that stuff had to happen in a matter of weeks in order for us to pivot that quickly so that we didn't go under. Because if I would have had to process uh, $300,000 worth of refunds, we probably wouldn't be alive right now. So that was a huge, um, it was a huge like curveball. And then it was like, just like all the other things I'm talking about, it, it proved that, uh, you know, I can make anything happen. Mm -hmm. You know, if you put your mind to it, you can make anything happen. So the same lessons I took from 13 years old, where you didn't, I didn't have enough money to make that dream happen. I took those same things and like, let's figure this out. Let's yep. make it work. And, and we did. And we, we got through last year completely successfully. And we're ahead right now where even if this continues for another year, uh, acrobatic arts will be solvent. So that's pretty huge for a wow. business like arts and the arts. Yeah. When you think about how many companies have really been affected by COVID in a negative way. Like the fact that you were able to turn it into a positive is unbelievable. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, baton twirlers can kind of take the same notion. I know it's not ideal to twirl in your house or in your basement. Like I can't even, I can stand up and touch my ceiling in my basement here, but let me tell you, if I'm gonna be teaching baton, if I'm teaching baton, we're gonna have best rollers in all of the world <laughs> after, after COVID. <laughs> That's so true. And isn't there always something to work on? You know, there is. There's always, and don't waste this time. This is, yep. you know, if, if you don't use this time to move forward, somebody else will. So let's get on it. There's mm -hmm. always something you can work on. Yeah. Oh, body work, like, yeah, rolls, like contact. Like just because you can't do your aerials doesn't mean you can't do your body work. So. Um, all right. So uh, what's the most important thing you have learned in your life and your career so far? most important thing deep question yeah <laughs> um i guess the most important thing i've learned is that if you really put your mind to it you can accomplish anything just like my mom said so and that it really has stuck with me through my life and it's been true for me so um i'd say that that was that was something pretty important that i learned cool yeah mrs blow is pretty proud of you <laughs> Um, and who are you most grateful for? Oh gosh, that list is super long. So, um, I am super grateful for my parents. Uh, my mom and dad are awesome. They're amazing. They've been, they've been so supportive throughout my entire journey. Uh, the goods and the bads, you know, my mom cried with me when I was 11 and had to drop out. She didn't want it any more than I did. She loved, uh, no, she loved going to bingo, but she loved going out for a smoke with the other moms outside of St. Chad's. So I think she was just as heartbroken when we had to leave and she cried with me and she encouraged me even though I think, I mean, she must have been looking at me like I was crazy going back with the little amount that I had in my bank account. I mean, it was $3,000. That was a lot of money for a 14 year old, but she knew how much it really cost and she probably knew it wasn't really going to be enough. So she supported me through all that. She never said, mm, I don't think it's going to happen for you. She was like, give it a try, see what happens, you know. So um, I'm appreciative of that. Um, I'm super appreciative of Maureen. She, uh, she was tough on me, but I learned so many good things from her and uh, I'll, I take those things for the rest of my life. She said, a dance education lasts a lifetime and she's not kidding, it really does. The, I was only a twirler for five years and yet I would credit it with shaping my entire life. So that I think says a lot about how she was able to coach me. Um, my friends that are with me right now that have been with me through this whole journey and i talk talking specifically to loren and sandra right now uh i have to give like a huge shout out because same thing you know they've they've just believed in me through the whole thing loren pushes me like no one else does and sometimes it's hard to hear the truth from her but um it's made me a much better person. So I'm very appreciative of that too. And I mean, like I said, there's countless other people, but. Yeah, no, um, I agree. Yeah, so awesome. Well, thanks. That completes our formal question because <laughs> it's not formal at all. Um, but you have really provided us some really incredible 
insight and like perspective and just seeing the world through your eyes, I feel it could energize like, I don't know, a whole city. So thank you, Mandy. I'm gonna do a couple of rapid fire questions to learn uh, who the real Mandy Yep um, is. <laughs> I don't know this part, Christian. <laughs> it's okay, don't worry, it's all good. Um, it only lasts like a couple minutes. I'm um, probably just like a minute. <laughs> okay, so cake or pie? Cake. Godfather or Star Wars? Godfather. Do you like the word dapper? Yes. Uh, big dogs or small dogs? Neither. <laughs> How many hours of sleep uh, hours of sleep do you need? At least eight. Um, are women complicated? Yes. Say good day, mate, in an Australian accent. Good eye, mate. <laughs> <laughs> How often is it healthy to cry? At least once a week. <laughs> What's your favorite carb? Bread, pasta, rice, or potatoes? Rice. Uh, oh, that's right. I remember that. Um, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? Uh, good question. I got too many for God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, stale Sour Patch Kids or fresh circus peanuts? That's gotta be Swedish berries, but I guess Sour Patch Kids. I remember the Swedish berries. We bought like a bag like this. Um, paper or plastic? Paper. Um, are rats cute? No. <laughs> What's your favorite car? Mm, the one that's in my driveway that Jason buys for me. <laughs> uh, do you know how to sell sedans? No. Um, uh, out of a scale of one to 10, how good are you at wiffle ball? Zero. <laughs> um, do you believe in love at first sight? Yes. And how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? Zero. Uh, what is your ideal outside temperature? 23. Um, favorite type of muffin? Mm, raisin bran. And last question, giving presents or getting presents? Giving. Awesome. See, that wasn't so painful, was it? <laughs> no, it's always the cat and dog question that gets me because I'm a kind of no pets kind of girl. And every time somebody asks me that one, I'm like, oh, I got to say the part where I don't like that. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. So um, we're going to open it up to the audience here. Um, and you can put your hand up and, or put questions in the chat and uh, unmute yourself. Um, I have Stephen Copas. <laughs> with his hand up you can unmute yourself Even you're so cute in that picture you're like this big which, which picture now or <laughs> <laughs> yeah those pictures that and that and the and that slideshow was pretty fun seeing some of those pictures yeah um i have a couple questions for you first of all really no pets at all like turtle fish nothing no pets nothing eh all right so one question for you how did how did you scale so fast? Like, and how are you able to grow the people in or that work for you in order to be able to scale that fast? Uh, okay, so scaling fast, I did by figuring out what the who the customer was and getting to know that customer well. And in both cases, with both of my businesses that I was able to scale, I was that customer at some point. So I was the the little dancer who wanted to dance. And so I knew what that dancer wanted when I owned, owned, owned the dance studio. And I was the studio owner who had a, a need to fill when I started acrobatic arts. So for example, with acrobatic arts, I knew the things that I needed to say to that studio owner to make them want to join what we were doing. And I also knew what we needed to build for them to actually want that product. They wanted simplicity. They wanted a program that they could, um, that the parents would understand, that the student would understand, that would be easy for them to market. They wanted a program that would be uh, universal, that no matter where in the world you went, you'd be able to find that same recognizable brand. And then I took all of that information that I knew about that person, created the program that fit that, and then I was able to really sell that well because I believed it was what they needed and what they wanted. And, and it was because I knew that person, so it worked. Um, and then, and. I guess like practically, I did it mostly on Facebook uh, ads when, when we started Acrobatic Arts. So I learned how a Facebook ad works and I went deep dive into what that meant and, and how it worked and what I had to do in order to do, uh, you know, 
all the different things within a Facebook ad to make it show up on the right person's account at the right time when they're thinking about this problem that they're having, that they don't have a good ACRA program. Uh, and then I made that happen. I made that ad show up for that person at that time um, by learning how the algorithms work and, and that kind of thing. Crazy. Um, yeah, sink or swim, right? Dive in. Uh, other question I have for you is, I mean, with acrobatic arts, it's so big and everything like that. And you're traveling all the time. How do you balance your work life? Great question. This year has been really good for us, actually. I feel like I really got to connect with my kids in a way I hadn't over the last two years because I had gotten so busy. True. Uh, but my family always comes first and I will turn things down um, in order to be here when I need to be here. I also really try to work when my kids are at school. So acrobatic arts really didn't take off until my kids started grade one. And then I learned how to make really good use of my time while they were at school and be done when they got home from school. Cause that was the whole goal. I wouldn't have even started this if I didn't want my weekends and evenings free. So why would I fill that back up again? Um, and I'm pretty efficient with my time. I'm actually really, if I could say that I'm good at one thing, I think that that would be one of the things I'd mention that I'm very efficient with my time. So no minute is wasted. You know, while we were getting ready for this meeting and there was five minutes before you guys came on, I answered three email and, you know, and five minutes before that, I actually had a meeting with somebody before I met with Kristen, you know, like there is no wasted minute. Um, and that way I'm able to uh, effectively use my work time and then close the office door and effectively be with my family without having to think about work. Awesome. One follow-up. Have you mastered that flop yet? <laughs> I can do it. I okay. can't get in here. Uh, I would. But <laughs> I'm also in my pajamas on the bottom. I, rem I remember all those bruises as well. Huh, if it, so. The fish <laughs> flop? No, they, the swan the, died. The swan died, oh, right. The yeah. flop. <laughs> well, Whatever. Flop. You know what I was. She knew what I meant. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, All right. We, we have a question from Leisha. Hi, everyone. Um, I, always, I always tell you, Mandy, I am so proud of you, and I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to say um, uh, before I ask my question is... Uh, as a, I guess, as a kudo and what I, what I watch when I've watched you go through this whole process over how many years I've known you, um, is uh, you're masterful at letting people use the gifts they have. <laughs> and uh, you're very good at like, what gift do you have? And you're very good at that. And I want you, when you come on board, you're gonna be doing that gift that you're passionate about and that you know, and you're going to be really like, I know you're going to do that because you're passionate about it. And when you talk about passion and the importance of that, to me, that's, that's so good. You've been so great at being able to do that, like finding what people's passions are and using those gifts and talents that people have in order to, uh, in order to help you grow as well and help your business grow. So I really appreciate that. My question just has to do, I'm going to bring you back to Baton and go back to, um, to your time in Winnipeg here. Um, and, uh, and the growth, I, you know, Kristen and I would always talk about, and Jane would always talk about just like, oh my gosh, how's she getting all these kids? Like, it's crazy. How she's just growing these, these programs. And, um, and, and what do, what would you say are some of the best sort of, and, and because we're going through this COVID time too, and we're always trying to think about incentives and games and things to get, to keep kids going. So what are some things that you maybe used back then in terms of incentives sort of to keep kids coming back and to get them excited about, about Baton and growing Baton and, uh, and some things maybe you've used during this time too through your business um, to help sort of keep dancers motivated and, um, and things that you've done. If there's any games or um, other incentives that you've used. So just diving into that. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I think if you get a Baton into a kid's hand, uh, at least one out of 10 of them is going to be intrigued and be interested in trying that. And then if you can find a way to make them successful within the first, you know, time that they have that baton in their hand, and that can just be this, like, you know, it doesn't have to be much, but if they caught it and that, and they felt like that was hard and then they did it, um, that feeling of accomplishment, I think is what draws people to baton and what keeps them in it. I know that was the case for me. So I just sort of made that same thing when I went out there to, to teach the kids. So when I went and taught the school programs, I taught things that I knew that they could learn in lesson one. 
And when I started teaching for aerial fusion, I made sure that what they were learning in, in lesson one was going to set them up for success in lesson two. And that in lesson two, they were gonna have at least one thing that day that they were successful at. And same with lesson three and same with lesson four. And I do the same thing with acro. Um, I, I make sure that every kid in the class that I'm teaching, um, every single kid, and I really do make sure that I see everyone um, feel successful about something that they did in that class, that they accomplished something. It was worth it for them to come to class today. It, it mattered. It made a difference. They got better. Um, and I think that's why I was able to get the kids to come in and, then, and that's why I was able to grow it too. They didn't just come in and drop. They came in and they stayed um, for the most part. So, so that would be my piece of advice for that. I don't. I, games are fun and definitely make it fun. But I think even more than making it fun, Maureen used to always say, "Being good is fun." <laughs> she used to tell us that. She, you know, she she get mad about the parents. The parents just want fun. The parents all all they want is fun. You know what's fun? Being good. That's fun. You know. <laughs> now go out there and do twenty five more. And um and she was right. Being good was fun. Do you remember her saying that, Kristen? <laughs> Uh, I still remember. I she still says that. <laughs> She's like that. That idea of competence and feeling competent is is so important. You know, it, it, they they need to feel like they've accomplished something, and they need to feel competent in order to want to continue in something. You know, at whatever level of competence that is, they have to make sure they they're feeling competent. So I, that is something I've definitely taken from Maureen and and some of the webinars I've heard her speak at. You know, she yeah. does talk about that. The importance of yeah. Being good, it's, it's fun, it's, you, but you need to build that competence. And it's not about being good in terms of winning everything all the time. It's about being good in terms of mastering skill and, yeah. and the importance of being able to master that and feeling like you can continue from there. So, yeah. yeah. And, and a really smart teacher is able to figure out what everyone's going to be competent at and to make them feel special about being competent at. So a lot of the times I will use the game in class for that one kid that's definitely not gonna catch their two turn today or whatever the thing is that everybody else is doing. And the game will almost be geared to that kid because I know that they're good at this one particular thing and they're gonna shine in that one particular moment and that's gonna bring them back again next week even though they were unsuccessful for the other 58 minutes of class. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. You know, it's, I just want to say, to hear you and Kristen say that, you know, you guys were just like my idols. So when you guys say that, you know, you're proud of me, it just makes me want to cry. Well, we are proud of you, Mandy. But yeah. Like, I feel like you are now our mentor. So yeah, it's interesting how things flip. Um, any other questions from the gallery? Man, I know you're itching to know about Mandy. I know we chatted for a while here. Um, any of the athletes who are joining us today want to ask a question? I know that the athletes are on the call. <laughs> Let's see. How about you, Susan? I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> awesome. Oh, that look. Why are you have to pick on me? What? <laughs> me? I'm the only Susan here? <laughs> There's the only Susan. Um. <laughs> Hi. Um. <laughs> I have a question. That's okay. No worries. I'm just picking on you. Thing. This is great. <laughs> That's funny. Sorry. That's okay. Oh, Laura. Laura, we have a question from Laura. She's one of our athletes, Mandy. From oh, hi, everyone. Hi, Here, I put my camera on. Sorry. I'm in my bedroom. <laughs> but, um, hi. Um, okay, so you mentioned um, a little bit about how you were only a twirler for, like, a short period of time. And through that time, you received, like, not backlash, but some constructive criticism about being from a young age and then going back into like big con like competitive world. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily that's something I've dealt with, but just like the underlying backlash from people, like how did you overcome that as an athlete and like continue to push through and thrive through the like knowingness of kind of having people not on your side in the background? Well, I like to prove people wrong. So it was like fuel to me when, you know, when I came back and uh, as a, as a 14 year old and like in the, back in the day, Buffalo Gals 
uh, had a huge roster of people that they could choose from to be on the team. And there was only nine spots. So to get on the team was really difficult. And, um, you know, for me to come in and have that as my dream and for Maureen to even let me practice in the same gym as the kids who were going to be on that team. I, I mean, people didn't really like that, I think, until they saw how hard I was going to work. And it didn't take that long for me to win them over because I was really willing to put in the work. I really was. I, like I said, if there was um, an open gym, I was there all the time. And if there wasn't an open gym, I was practicing in my basement. I was practicing all the time. So when Maureen gave us a little combination and said, this is going to go into the routine, you know, when you come back tomorrow, I would come back tomorrow with it mastered, like, like never going to drop it again, mastered kind of situation. And I think once I had proven myself a little bit that that flipped into a place where I was actually kind of respected for, um, you know, how hard I was willing to work for what I wanted. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, I've got a question here. I know we kind of touched it about it um, earlier in the, um, when we had met, but um, I have a question from Kristen asking about like uh, your story about coming back after your time off. Um, like how long was your time off from twirling? So I left when I was 11 and I came back when I was 14. So about three years. And that's when Lucinda taught you and she said, get and a job. Loren. Loren. Oh, and Loren taught me first, I think, and then Loren moved to Red Deer to start with Holly, Chelsea, Michelle, and um, Lucinda took over Loren's job, and that was when she told me to get a job, yeah. <laughs> so blunt, too, just like, stop complaining and get a job. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a question here from Wendy saying, hi, Mandy, many congratulations on the success of acrobatic arts, and how have you utilized the multiple skills of so many baton twirlers? Can you tell me how you extended your business to so many countries? Sure. So um, the very first year we offered that uh, course at Martin School of Dancing, we got um, some of the people that were there it was actually twirlers, I think, that talked about it when they got back to Ontario. So the next course that we offered was in Toronto. And in Toronto, there was someone who had a friend from Perth, Australia. And they told this person from Perth, you know, you really need to learn about what, what's happening here in Canada. And they contacted me and said, you know, can you come over and teach your course here in Perth? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll get on a plane, you know. No idea that I needed a visa, like, you know, just <laughs> like everything else in my life. Like, I'll just get on the plane and we'll figure it out when we get there, I guess. Um, and that's pretty much what we did. We went and taught the course and, and then learned that you need a visa and there's some, like some rules surrounding these things, uh, which led to me having to get a visa to, to teach in the States as well. But basically it was like that. It's like one person heard about it here and then they told the person who they knew there. And then a Facebook ad would magically appear in Perth at that time because, because I knew those connections were happening and I knew how those algorithms worked. So then I would flood the, the dance teacher Facebook market with um, acrobatic arts ads. And so then, you know, those courses would sell out and then they would tell more people. And, and it just kind of went like that, Wendy. You are so smart. <laughs> That's so, so smart. Um, okay, well, uh, I know we're a little bit over time, but I just wanted to say thank you so, so much, Mandy, for taking time out of your crazy busy schedule. And um, sharing your knowledge, your passion, your memories with all of us here. Um, a lot of us have grown up with you. A lot of us have, um, some of us have coached you or judged you. And some of us are now really looking up to you. Actually, I think all of us are looking up to you. So thank you so much, Mandy. I love you to pieces. We wish you nothing but more success with acrobatic arts. And I hope you leave this um, Saturday night inspiration series so inspired and, uh, I hope you come back next week. <laughs> One million is coming to Mandy. That's right. <laughs> hey, Let's Ron. Go. Thanks, everyone. This is so much fun. Thanks, Kristen. It was so much Thanks. fun going through old photos. And yeah, I love seeing everyone. Yeah. We need to do this more often, I think, because this, this, I feel like just sharing the love and it's just igniting everybody's um, fuel again, like you say. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. You're a wonderful person. Oh, thanks, Ron. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, everything that Kristen, or she's been doing all these other people um, that are coaches and has been twirlers and stuff, you can see that they're 
blood is going right through to their heart about but, uh, baton and um, what you're doing that with working with the younger kids coming in in the same direction. Thank you so much for the world that we have all that kind of strong things in Canada. Oh, thank you so much, Ron. Thank you. <laughs> I judged you in that Switzerland. Judged <laughs> <laughs> you many a time. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably in all those costumes, Ron. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And again, shout out to uh, MBTSA, to Tammy, Olga, and um, Laura and Jonathan who joined us tonight, who are also on um, our technical team uh, for helping um, organize this evening too. Thanks everyone. Thanks Tammy for putting that together. It was awesome. <laughs>